And so I started training, giving people this sales training. So that was good. Then I moved to Sydney with my first boyfriend and then I was doing recruitment there and um, during the IT boom and I was making like, you know, $29,000 myself one month and 32000 the next month, minimum $8,000 a month. So that was really great. I loved what I did and loved selling the candidate to the client and, and vice versa and really matching their, you know, what they really wanted. Um, so that was good. And then I got a break to become a professional singer. Which oh, really? I, yeah, so was that when you were doing the theater stuff and when you came to the States? Uh, no, that was when I was, that was actually just, um, I was actually about 18 when I first went to the States and we did a musical, um, which was amazing. And oh, okay. So go back to the singing. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I always sang, I loved acting. I wanted to do Shakespeare, but I always sang and wrote music since I was in poetry, since I was 12 or 16. And, uh, yeah, I, and I ended up at this party in Vaucluse in a massive house and, um, they basically, I used to belt out this song um, and a cappella, and there were tons of people there. And I belted out this song, and everyone was like, Oh, that was so wonderful. And you know, thank you so much, which is fine. But then at 12 o'clock, what the owner of the house came back, and he's like, And his wife's like, You've got to sing that song for my husband. And I'm like, But everyone's just heard that song, and everyone's kind of into the party. And anyway, so I, I, they turned down the music, and I sang it again. But oh boy. That was yeah, I know. And they were like, okay, that was that was really good, you know, thank you. And um and then at three o'clock in the morning, there were just it was messy and everyone was just like, you know, dancing and the music was really loud. And the owner of the party said, Um, I've got a friend who's come in who's a professional singer, you need to sing that song. And of course I'm like, hell no to the no. <laughs> like, I can't possibly sing that song now. Like Everyone is so moved on because it's just really poignant. It was kind of Grace Knight and the Pips, the way we were. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, uh, beautiful song, but so not the time for it. And plus I'd already bloody done it to death. But I had that feeling like, you know, and this is one of my things actually. Um, I had so much resistance around it. And usually I believe resistance is where the gold is. Um, and, and, that, and it also majorly relates to sales because usually people are so good in all parts of their business but they've got this resistance to sales. And oftentimes in my life, the thing I've most got the resistance around, if I just meet that head on and just do it, that's when you get the breakthrough. And that's what happened here. The singer heard me. I started singing professionally, um, did over 2,000 gigs and recording and all sorts of weird and wacky and wonderful things. Mm -hmm. Loved it. Um, uh, but towards the end of it, I was feeling a little stifled. I, I mean, I do love business. Um, right. And I, I mean, what, like, is what, it about, what is it about business that you love? Uh, what is it about business that I love? I love helping people. I felt like I wasn't helping enough people. Well, I was, but I kind of, I'm all, I'm all about progress in my own life. Like, what am I learning in my own life? How am I progressing? How am I becoming more truly myself? How am I helping people? Mm -hmm. And um, in singing, you know, I was helping people kind of, but I just felt like there was something more. And I, I, I so anyway, I didn't know what to do because I couldn't go back to what I was doing. Um, so I prayed for my next step. I said, universe, please show me what's my next step meant to be. And within two days, one of my best friends who owns a marketing agency, she did spend a fortune on this launch. No one was signing up. She's like, Kate, I hate sales. Wish I didn't have to do it. Used to be great at sales. Can you please train me? So of course oh, I said, okay. So that's where it started. That's where it started. She got great results. And then I, I just, I, it clicked to me that stuff that had been so natural to me for so long, because I've been doing it for so long, that not everyone knew this stuff. And she got results so quickly. And that's what I found and what I do find that when people actually do spend just a bit of time on things and tweak things, their results really go up. Um, and the reason why I'm so pa passionate about sales is because if you don't have a hundred or two hundred thousand to spend on a salesperson, if you are in business for yourself, you are as um, who says um, someone says you're in the sales business. But you have to you have to do that piece yourself to start with, and it really can be serving people if you do it the right way. Right. You know, so, yeah. so when you and I first connected, one of the things that really appealed to me about what how you um, define what you do for people is that you're a sales and mindset coach for sales success. 
So yeah. when, you know, and I've always, I'm, Hey, I am the first person to raise my hand and say, you know, I'm, I'm not the greatest at sales. It makes me nervous, but I've also worked with coaches to help me get better with it. And I'm certainly a lot better, certainly could be improved. Certainly still have my own little personal things that, um, that I got to deal with to get beyond it. Well, so so when, when you, when you work with like a, a speaker, an author, a coach, um, you know, people who are sort of like solopreneurs or, or regular entrepreneurs, and they come to you for help. What is like one of the, what's one of the main things they say is like, I'm just so stuck because I can't get beyond. Yeah, great question, Kate. So um, a lot of people who are really worried and nervous about being salesy, you know, like they don't want to um, come across as inauthentic or just about the money. Right. And at the, the, the fear underneath that is the fear of being judged and not being liked because we all want people to like us, you know. Right. Um, so so what I want to say there is um, what's more important, you've got to ask yourself what's more important, because the, the, the first thing is actually um, that the people who are worried about being salesy and yeah. kind of manipulative and stuff, they're never the people like, that are salesy ever. Right, right. they're not because they're so worried about it they don't want to come across that way. No, usually because they are em empathetic people who oh, care right. Yeah. how other people think they love what they do they want to serve with what they do but they don't want to talk anyone into anything they just they just want people to say yes mm -hmm. you know just, and when i first started my business as good as i was at, at sales that's what i was like too i i made all people had to say um so um so how do we get started you know like because i didn't want to sell anyone i just wanted them to see how good this was and say yes naturally so if you're worried about coming across as salesy, don't worry about it because that's just not you. It's not who you are. If anything, you've got to lean more into a little bit more strategy and, and you know, just lean forward a little bit more into, into sales. Um, so that's the first thing, uh, worried about becoming being salesy. The okay, other thing wait, I say, wait, just excuse me for a second. Sure. So we've got a couple women on here, um, Paula um, and Lisa. And Paula said, great, to great topic. We all need sales mindset help, which is so true. Um, and Lisa says, you know, sales and mindset definitely go together, which is exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, so true. And in business, especially too, the more you, the longer you're in business, you re, the more you realize it's a, it's a mindset game. Um, but it, it certainly is with sales. And if you struggle with that whole salesy piece um, and being judged and not liked, I want you to ask yourself: Is it more important that people like you, or is it more important? that you serve people with that wonderful thing that you have to offer. As my friend Lisa Danforth says, it's washing. She always says, serve them with your brilliance. Yeah, absolutely. And the people I work with are so good at what they do, mm -hmm. but they're lacking clients and they're struggling with money because they're not putting themselves out there enough. So you have to make that decision, draw a line in the sand and say, I am standing for myself. I am standing for what I am doing. And I am standing for the people that I am yet to help. And, and that means just leaning into um, changing your mindset about sales. So if you have a mindset like I suck at sales, I hate sales, <laughs> just change that like thinking to like, what if you change that to, I used to suck at sales, but now I'm applying myself and I'm getting better and better and better. Do you also, when you work with people, that, um, when you work with your clients, do you also teach them, um, to, to basically, do you also teach them on how to how they can sort of like from a mindset standpoint, how they can value the service that they bring, like like to really remember what their value is and why they got into this in the first place. Yeah, it's that's a great one because it really, the more people you serve, the more certain you'll become about your own worth and that your you know how good it is that right. of what you've got to offer. Um, initially, what it does help to work with a coach because. Um, what I often help people do is see it from the client's perspective and I also give them confidence. I only work with people who are great at what they do, have got something great to offer. I say no to people all the time. But um, oftentimes people don't know and I'm like, this is gold. You've got to understand that this is amazing and maybe there's this person that's kind of, you know, on the fence and I'm like, you've got to, you've got to just, it's your, it's your kind of, um, you know, you've got to be in service and keep hitting this person up for this because they need this right now. This is going to save them hundreds of thousands of dollars or this is going to 
really help them get to the next step. And then once they do that and then they get the result and then that person gets, their client gets the result, they then feel more certain and they're like, yeah, look, I do have something valuable to offer. But I do understand when you first start out, it can be a little bit tricky. So mm -hmm. it's, good, it's really good to work with someone, get the messaging down of why what you do is so important know why what you do is so important and then you just need to work with more people um getting them that one really big result that they most need not the results you want to get get for them right, right. But the result they need right yeah. and those testimonials read those testimonials all the time read them before a sales call <laughs> you know sometimes we just leave them on our laptop right they won't be good there if you've got testimonials read them before your sales call and then get on and go look and you'll feel more like, yeah, you know what? I mean, if you had the cure to cancer, you wouldn't be worried about being salesy. You wouldn't be worried about the sales, you know, the sales call at all. You'd just be like sitting there going, I'm so sorry you're in this, you know, wherever you're at. Let me know how I can help. Okay. Um, Lisa's asking a great question. I just put it up on screen. What tips or tools do you recommend for shifting your mindset towards sales? Great question, Lisa. Um, so as a woman, I think we all have to in prove our ask muscles you know like um i know you know yeah how it, it's kind of just a lot of the time well especially well in australia um you know like it's the guys that ask the women out on dates i mean it's not quite so much anymore but it's usually the men that do the are, are more assertive and we kind of stand back and we wait to be asked mm -hmm. so you know even just to kind of um start thinking about to yourself, actually in my journal every day, one of the questions I ask myself out of the three is what do I really want? So even asking yourself that question and then how can I start asking for what mm -hmm. I really want? Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes it's just practice and even if you practice uh, building those ask muscles for yeah. a week or two, that can really help. Um, certainly your ask muscles, I like that. That's a good one, yeah. muscle memory. Yeah. But you're, you, really, you really do have to practice. Do you help people create... Um, like a sales script that works with their style, you know, like not your sales script, obviously from your expertise, but do you help them kind of come up with a sales script that they can you know, either have in front of them just as a safety tool Absolutely. or that they somewhat memorize that is, but still fits with their personality and approach? Absolutely. So how they set up the conversation um, is really important. I give them a framework of what needs to be kind of you know, hit in the sales conversation. And honestly, with sales, it's less about talking. Actually, some people way talk, talk too much and that's what needs to be tweaked. It's more about asking really great questions and listening. So um, where it's about coming up with those right questions that are for you and for your 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 audience. Your, right, your client, your ideal client, yeah. And that's really going to help you massively. And then I role play with people. And I say, okay, this bit's brilliant. Awesome, love it, love it, love it. This bit here, we're gonna change a little bit and we're gonna, you know, just do this. How, you know, what would you, how would you, what if you were to talk about or ask this question? They're like, yeah, I love that. Okay, that's great. So yeah, we workshop things until they feel really, really confident. And then once they've got a plan, they feel better. And you know, like I used to wing everything and I still do occasionally, but honestly, it's. <laughs> I'm don't really reveal busy. your secrets just kidding <laughs> yeah i've never done a live before i had nothing planned but um but uh, but um really like if you have a framework it can give you freedom within the framework is what i've discovered because once you have that framework and you have that down you have the confidence and then you can play in that a little bit depending mm -hmm. on who you're talking talking to but it should always be a really nice conversation like what we're having now it's not right. it shouldn't be it's never pushy and, you know. Oh, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, everything from the approach for anything I do with any of my prospecting, if you will, or, or getting people on a discovery call is always about building and nurturing the relationship first because you've got to build the know, like, and trust. You've got to go through all of that. And then that will eventually lead to the transaction. But if you start out with just a transaction mindset, I mean, I think you're almost always going to fail unless you're working with a really wacky type of client. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Those are not the clients I want to work with. Paula has a question here. Um, what are your other two questions she journals? Yeah, great question, Paula. Hey, um, so the questions I ask every day are, what do I really want? What do I have to sacrifice to get that? 
and what am I grateful for? So um, interesting in life, sometimes we have to sacrifice some of our old beliefs and mindsets um, or our comfort zone. And, and if I work out every day, what do I really want? And again, especially as women, I don't know if anyone's on who's maybe had children and been serving the family for their whole life. Oh, but there's several of us because I know I can see who's on and I know some of them personally. So oh, we can relate to that. Yeah, cool. So it's what do I really want is such a powerful question because it's how it's getting you in touch with what's in here rather than what's out there rather than just going about it. And even with your business and stuff, like maybe you've got some changes that you want to make, you know, and the only way you're going to know that is by asking yourself and you start getting super clear every day. Plus right. it's really good for goal setting as well. Like, you know, um, like I might just have a couple of things for that day. This is what I really want to happen today. And I can kind of see into that, feel into that. And that uh, I believe in the law of attraction starts kind of you down mm -hmm. that track. And then that, what do I have to sacrifice? Um, it might be, um, yeah, things like, uh, you know, like for instance, if you hate sales, it might be like I sacrifice that belief that I'm no good at sales. What if I sacrifice that and actually started saying to myself, I'm getting better and better at sales all the time. I'm applying myself and this is actually quite fun. I'm finding sales fun. If you start even just talking to yourself in that thing, yeah. well, how can I make sales fun? Like the question well, it can be fun. fun. And actually, yeah. after you have it, start having some successes, then you start, obviously, that builds your confidence. First it becomes so fun. And exactly. like, people say it all the time. I work with so many people who say they hate sales. And they're like, hey, this is actually pretty fun. This is actually pretty fun. And especially because it's getting you more success and money coming in, which, you know, people need. If you want to have a business, you need that money coming in. And, you, you know, if you want to affect lives, you just need to get this piece down. And it's not that hard. Trust me on that. Well, no, one of my things, my I had a sales coach that I worked with about three years ago, and um, he said, you know, instead of saying I hate sales, just start faking it till you make it and saying I love sales. Like, don't say I hate sales anymore. You know, it's yeah. a matter of just like you've got to completely reframe that. Totally. I completely believe, I agree with him that you, you shouldn't say, I, um, you know, like I hate sales sometimes, but we have to believe what we say. So sometimes right. even if you acknowledge you know, I used to hate sales, but now I'm applying myself and I'm yeah. feeling more confident. I'm and, and then just start studying a little bit, like come to podcasts like these and, um, you know, learn from other people and say, hey, that's not that hard. I could do that. Right. I used to hate sales, but I'm getting better and better. I'm, so, I'm starting to feel sales is kind of fun and just move it through, you know, progressively. Um, yeah, because, uh, yeah. So, but, but yeah, that I completely agree. All right. We really we're going to switch gears a little bit here. So, um, when, when I was, you know, researching you and looking into more about your, your philosophy and your, your methodology on sales, um, one of the things that I love that you talked about was objections. Um, so when you do make the sale and the person is like not ready to buy, um, you have this, this great thing that you talk about, about no, there's N O and there's K N O W. So why don't you, um, why don't you dig into that? And then after you explain that, we have another question from another viewer. Sure, love to. Um, so, yeah, a lot of us, you know, a lot of my clients and stuff, they have a great sales conversation before they work with me, of course. Um, they have a great sales conversation and then they get to the end of it and they know the person is perfect to work with them or buy their product or service. And then they get an objection and they just take it as truth and they're like, oh, okay. Um, well, thank you anyway. Well, and first of all, give a quick example of what an objection is, just so for people sure. who are watching aren't, so, don't really know what it means. Just give an, an example. An objection might be, um, oh, it's too expensive, or I can't afford that right now. Or I have or, to talk to my spouse. Like, I have to talk to my spouse, or I haven't got time for this right now. So they're all objections, right? And here's the thing with human behavior is when we are interested in something, we're not going to go, isn't that too expensive? If you've got a question in your mind, you go, oh, no, that's too expensive. You know, it's just what we do. It's a weird thing we do. So the first thing to understand if, when you get an objection is you need to ask yourself, is this a really a no, an N-O, or is this a K-N-O-W, a no? Do they need to know more? And 90% of the time, at least, they just need more information. They need more clarity and information, exactly. Yeah. They need more clarity and information. I love um, that you make that distinction between the N-O and the K-N-O-W. That's great. Yeah. So, you know, um, like 
you can always say, look, we can leave the conversation here, but I'm just really, I'm really um, interested um, because I feel like you're a really great fit for this. Mm -hmm. um, and you're saying it's too expensive. Do you mean that it's like too expensive for, you know, fair market value or what you've got to spend right now? And then they might say, oh, look, um, I actually teach people to seed the conversation earlier so they know it's not too expensive for fair market value. And, and that often does, I think the best way to answer objections is to head them off before you get them. But if you get it at the end of it and you've gotten to this point, um, if they say, well, you know, it's just right now, um, I don't really have the budget for this, right? right? And then you get to that question, you're like, okay, that's fine. So when you're talking about the budget you have, um, now, and then it's about how do you then add value? You know, if it's back pain or whatever, I mean, they're saving for a holiday and they're going to go on holiday with this back pain that you can help them solve. What's that worth to them? You know, mm -hmm. uh, if they've got a certain amount in their budget, um, but you're going to help them make money or save money, um, you just have to kind of be able to make that case. You say, okay, you've got, you know, um, how much do you have in your budget for this right now? And they say, would you have more if you, say, got a new client right. on board? you know, right. whatever it is, and then help them to see the value of your service again and just keep on digging. Um, it's kind of a little different every time, but oftentimes even when you just answer that first one or two, they'll go, oh, that makes sense. Right, and they, they've, because they've had, well, look at what Paula just said, you know, yes, people often need to know more so they can make a decision that feels good to them. Definitely. So I, I, have, such, I just want to say really quickly, yeah. such a great point to, and such a great mindset to have um, what, what was her name, Paula, was it? Paula, yes. Yeah, Paula. yeah, great Paula because it's, you know, you have to understand, um, you know, you're just trying to serve people and you need to give them all the information. So you welcome objections. You want to kind of say, like, you know, is there any buts? Are you kind of struggling with anything? How do you feel about the money conversation? And you bring them out because you want people to be empowered to make the best decision that's right for them. Exactly. And if you want to know, it is so fine, right? right? But hopefully you're talking to the people that are best, a, a great fit for you, and it will be a yes. Um, but it's that's a great mindset. I just wanted to say thanks, Paula. All that. right. We've got another question from Sally, and she says, I'm curious about how you organize your sales brain. When I'm busy, I don't have time. And then when things are quiet, it's too late. Do you make a calendar? Any tips? And thank you. Awesome. Um, thanks, Sally. So with your sales, what I'd say is you do it first up. First you thing what? You wait with your sales stuff, your follow ups and everything. First thing in the morning. First thing in the morning. Okay. So now after your, for me, it's like journal, like journal for ten minutes, yoga, breakfast, and then it's sales stuff. Like who am I following up today? What do I most resist? Because you have the most energy in the morning. There is yeah. that hundred yeah. percent. You've got the most energy. Clarity. Class. That's that whole thing too about eating the frog early. You know, like I think um, one of the poets said, you know, if you've got a frog to eat, you know, something you're resisting. Um, uh, eat that frog early because then everything else in the day, you know, is pretty easy after that. So there's that as well. Um, but the thing is you need to make it a priority. So, yes, do you need to schedule it? Yes, you do. You need to just put that in half an hour of follow-up. Where am I at? You need to get it in your mindset that that is part of your business day now. And you know, some of your follow up will be through email. Some of it will be through phone. You know, um, you know, don't get locked into I'm not going to pick up the phone. Sometimes you're going to have to pick up the phone, you know, especially if you've already got a step and a conversation established. You actually may get the foot in the door even better if you actually take the time to make a call. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, people. Listen, are, I don't mean a cold call. I'm talking like you've already got a relationship, so it's a warm call. <laughs> yeah, 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 and yeah, calling's a great way to reconnect with people. But any any way you reconnect with people, um, and there's there should be different types of follow up and so on, depending on if you know if you're prospecting, if you're answering questions on LinkedIn from a video or a blog yeah. post put up. But whatever it is, whatever the process you have that's working right now, if you don't have a process, please get one. Um, but, um, but please do, yes, do schedule it. Don't make it like a last minute thing. Otherwise, making money for you will be a last minute thing. And That's a really good point. You know, if you put it off, you're putting off making your money. income possibility too. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And plus, people love it when you follow them up. I've done this many times myself and especially with super busy people and really big sales. They'll be like, Kate, thank you so much that you finally got me after like 10 calls. Um, uh, you know, I really appreciate this. I've just been so busy, but I am actually interested. And then they become a really good sale. Um, I know personally when I've been interested in buying a program 
So I wasn't ready at that time, but I was ready like six months later. She never followed me up again, and I just felt really thrown away. Mm -hmm. She called me kind of once a month or just touch base with me every couple of months and saying, hey, Kate, how's it going? And I probably would have gone ahead actually in the next call or maybe the following call after that. But I felt really a bit let down by that. Um, we got to understand everybody, need, ha, you know, you, you're selling what you're selling because you've got a problem to solve. People have still got this problem. They're people. And, and try and give them the best service that you can. Right. And I always, I always say when I'm following up, if um, if you're not interested at all, that's fine, just let me know now and I just won't call you again. You'll be completely off my list. Right. If you are and you're just not ready, do you mind if I call you back um, You know, in a month? You just uh, brought up a really good point. So sales is sales, but sales, the, the sales process, the journey into making the sale is also a customer, an opportunity for customer experience. Um, one of the people that's that's um, watching right now, Lisa Danforth, is really good about customer experience. And it made me think of, um, if you don't mind, I wanna add something to Sally's question about any tips for um, organizing your sales brain, is you know having a CRM, a customer relationship management tool, can help you in that process, because you may have one conversation and you may have another conversation after that. And so you wanna schedule that so that that person doesn't feel thrown away like you did when the follow-up didn't happen. Because if the follow-up doesn't happen within a certain sort of opportun opportunistic time, you can you could actually lose that sale just because you haven't given them good customer value. Yeah. Um, and and so that's I think that's a really interesting point that sometimes I think we think we need to know how to do sales and we need to know how to do customer service. And they actually kind of overlap even at the very beginning. They really do. And and if you're doing sales really well, you, you you kind of build a relationship right from the get go. You're asking the important questions and um, they're sharing with you. And um, you can kind of get that relationship a lot deeper, uh, you know, quite quickly yes. when you have a good sales conversation. Um, yeah. And that can last for the lifetime of the customer. Right. You know, if you, when you really try and make sure you understand what's really going on for them, um, how and and come at it from can I help you? I'm not sure yet. Let's let's see. Let's work this out together. Right. You know, yeah. So I'm gonna also switch gears a little bit too because I want to allow for some time for us to talk about your summit coming up. But um, one of the things I mentioned to you when we were when we were talking before is you have a really cool thing about testimonials, like capturing testimonials, but also um, you know you have a scale for it, and so you called them. You mentioned like referral leads and you yeah. have this scale of one to 10 thing. Can you yeah. explain that? Cause that's really kind of cool. And it does have to do with getting and capturing client testimonials. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when you are working with people, you just send them out a really simple questionnaire, like in the first kind of couple of weeks and just say to them, like, if, you know, if you were going to recommend, how likely would you be to recommend this to a friend or a family member out of 10? Right, so if we give you a five, right, you know you need to get on the phone straight away and say, hey, you know, I know this is a five and I really want to make this right. What's going on? What's missing? What, you know, so that gives you a really good heads up. Right. Let's say um, um, a six, seven, you want to then say, um, what we really want to do is make this an excellent 10 out of 10 experience for everybody. I'm wondering what's missing or how can we possibly make this better? What do I need to do more to serve you better or whatever? Yeah. Exactly. And then if they are an 8 to a 10, you say that it's absolutely brilliant. Would you mind if we jumped on a really quick call because I'd love to hear about your experience. And, you know, then you can have like a little testimonial video or you can just um, get them to fill out a little testimonial form. It's really good to have a structured testimonial form that actually helps um, answer objections and stuff when people read it. So they just fill it out. Um, other people read it. And, um, and also, obviously, it means that they are likely to um, refer you to friends and right. family. And you can say, look, you know, um, that's so great to hear. By the way, I've got a great referral program. So if there's anyone who's struggling with this like you were, please, um, you know, you can use this link and, you know, I'll give you whatever the referral program is that you've set up. Okay. Uh, yeah, and uh, and that can be a really good way of getting referrals. But, yeah, it's a nifty little 
nifty little question from multiple. I like the scale, that's just different. I'll add something to that for those of you who are watching. I have um, another thing that on top of what Kate just mentioned is another way to get testimonials is actually through your LinkedIn profile. You can actually ask people to give you a LinkedIn recommendation. Now to get a recommendation from someone so that it shows up on your LinkedIn profile, they actually have to have a LinkedIn profile because it has to come from them. But so if you get a recommendation on LinkedIn and it's probably a few sentences, it's probably like a little short paragraph, take out one sentence that's from within that recommendation and copy it and go back up in your LinkedIn profile up to like your experience section where, um, where it's about your current role as you as the entrepreneur. And you can quote it and say, as, as mentioned by um, a client of mine, and you can see it in the recommendations below, paste the quote in there so that you can get that actually as a little bit of a one-liner testimonial in your LinkedIn profile. Um, that's something I do in my profile and I actually advise a lot of my clients to do that too. What a great tip. Yeah, just this great little tip. That so let's, right. since I brought up LinkedIn, ding, 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 ding. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> so so um, I wanna talk a minute. So Kate is going to be having a global virtual summit that starts next week. I think it starts on the 17th. I get so confused with the time zones with Australia. No, it's actually, so it's the 17th in Australia and it's our side. 16th on, in the States. Oh. Yeah, that's right. I think right. it might be the day before in the state from the 16th. That's so right. um, Kate's summit is a LinkedIn lead generation summit. And Kate has 21 LinkedIn experts. Um, I always like quiver when I say that. And then I'm going to say, and I'm in there, which means I'm saying I'm a LinkedIn expert. So I guess I am in some ways, but an expert is somebody who is always learning. So that makes me feel better. <laughs> But anyway, she has 21 speakers of, of note is um, New York Times bestselling author Dave Kerpen, K-E-R-P-E-N, who is the author of The Art of People. And his most recent book is Likeable Social Media. So Dave is going to be a speaker. And what is his topic, Kate? Just quickly. Um, so I literally just um, interviewed Dave. Um, he's got some really great tips on building your following, connect and how to kind of um, get more followers. I mean, he's got three quarters, quarters of a million. Yeah. So he has some great tips on like how to actually, yeah, get more followers, um, how to niche down um, as well, because everyone needs to do that right. a little more. So yes, they do, for sure. Everybody. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of really good things in there from Dave. And, and our friend Vivica Von Rosen will be speaking. Isn't she, is she talking about uh, LinkedIn Lives? Yeah, she talks a little bit about Our LinkedIn video. Live. And also, um, interestingly, video for, yeah, video for the, the kind of the customer journey, depending yeah. on where they're, they're, they're at. Um, and one I love for nurturing customers that you already have. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, very interesting. Well, vid video on LinkedIn is hot, whether it's native video where you upload videos or if it's LinkedIn Lives. Now, one thing, just so you all know who are watching, um, you know, if you have Facebook, you can do a Facebook Live. Anybody can do one. If you're on LinkedIn, you actually have to apply for LinkedIn Live. And so um, you'd have to go into Google and do LinkedIn Live apply. And then you can send in an application and be considered. It took me nine months and five applications to finally get LinkedIn Live last spring. So I don't know their vetting process, but once you get LinkedIn Live, then you can do this kind of thing here where you can you know, interview people, show your thought leadership and your, and your expertise. So tell us about a little bit more about your summit. Um, I know it's free and I'm gonna, put up, um, I'm gonna put up a little link for people. They can access the summit for free, but tell us a little bit more about it. Sure. Um, so if you're in business, you do need to get more people into your funnel. You know, you need to kind of get out there. And there's so many different ways of doing that on LinkedIn. Uh, and for me, LinkedIn was a game changer for my own business. Um, and I do it a specific way, but there's so many ways to do it. So that's why I put together all these experts who've got areas of specialty to then teach me included and all my viewers um, how they do it so that my hope is that all the viewers are going to find a few things that they can do that they can start actioning and getting better and better at so they can start bringing in leads the right way. Here's the other thing um, that I'm really passionate about is there's been a lot of spam and stuff happening on LinkedIn in the last year. Yes, there has. But and that's because of people using automation tools that go against LinkedIn's terms of service. <laughs> yeah. So um, a lot of people aren't quite sure how to do things. So this is all I've really carefully vetted the experts 
to be have the same ethos as me, which is it's very customer centric, you know, building real relationships um, and doing it the right way. So, you know, uh, so it just hopefully is going to give our whole community a better, um, you know, like everyone, if everyone's doing it the right way, it's just better for everybody and plus more successful for you because the more leads you have coming on, the more sales conversations you can have and the more money you can make and the more people you can serve. Yes. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's a bit about the summit. Um, so it's free, start time next week, 10 days, two to three speakers a day. Um, the other thing I don't like is when people have like 20 speakers on one day. Yeah. Of course, they don't last for a day. It's like, how do you watch all of that? Um, right. So, yeah. That's, I've, that's I've just, a good model. Yeah, I've just kept it two, two a day, maybe three. The interviews are short and like half an hour around this, this kind of time. So, and action orientated. So they're not just, you know, it's, I really want to help people with this, which with ever state, stage they're in with LinkedIn, whether they're fairly new or they've been around for some time, there's ways we can do it so much better. And that's what it's about. Okay. So we got a question. This is actually sort of from me, from my friend, Kevin. Hey, Kevin, thanks for tuning in. Um, I think you meant to say dumb question, not dump question. <laughs> Mr. PR man. Um, so he asks, how is LinkedIn Live better or different than a podcast, which is excellent question. So a podcast is typically audio only, except some people who do podcasts also videotape it, which then makes it a webcast. Um, and then people upload the video on their channel, like on Spotify or, or iTunes or whatever. But they could also upload it um, onto, a, onto a social channel, like with a link. So LinkedIn Live is basically like Facebook Live. Um, they encourage you, if you're going to do a LinkedIn Live, to have it be like 40 minutes, 30, 40 minutes, maybe an hour, depending on the, on the engagement. Um, and you can either be a talking head or you can interview people. You do have to use a third party app. Um, I use StreamYard, which is awesome. And it's like a broadcast studio. So actually, if I wanted to on my LinkedIn Live, I could have up to 10 people in here um, in this studio. and We could all be seeing each other and talking to each other. And um, it's also just a way to build your thought leadership on LinkedIn. So whenever I interview people, I started my little Coffee with Kate show as an actual video that I used to upload on the LinkedIn. But when you upload just a, like a video file onto LinkedIn, it can't be longer than 10 minutes. Um, it has to be uh, longer than three seconds, which shouldn't be hard to do, but no more than 10 minutes. A LinkedIn Live is live. And so since I'm using the StreamYard tool, I can actually stream to Facebook, my Facebook personal page, my Facebook business page, and my LinkedIn channel. So I'm on three channels all at once. So that's a quick answer. Um, and then I just want to put a shout out here. Um, Alexander has been watching and he just said, awesome. Thank you for this. And I think he must mean the summit. So I'll put that link back up just so that people want to go into it. So Kate, um, how can people get in touch with you if they want to talk to you more about, um, helping them with their sales mindset? Sure. Oh, kind of hit me up at LinkedIn. Um, I am always around. Just um, you know, send me a request. Um, you can also follow me to get like really quick, simple, always action orientated, one minute videos on different sales things, how to answer different objections and how to close and all that stuff. So that's all on LinkedIn as well. Um, if you join my summit, you can reply to any of the emails. It's me at the other end. Um, and of course, I've got my website, katehallacy.com. You can pop over to that um, anytime and uh, again, send me a message. I'm here to help. So um, yeah, feel free to reach out. Great. Well, I'm happy to have you as a new friend. Yeah. And, and, uh, and someday when I get to Australia, bucket list trip, I'll be sure to look you up there. And you certainly, um, if you ever get this way to the States in the Northeast, certainly look, look me up here. But thank yeah. you. I look forward to your summit because I'm going to watch all the other speakers. Um, I'm going to be speaking about personal story and how to use it in your profile. And I think we talked a little bit about LinkedIn Live too, didn't we? <laughs> we did. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks everybody for tuning in. And um, uh, thanks for everybody watching the replay as well. If you do want to leave any questions in here, tag Kate at Kate or Lacey um, or me, Kate Payne, P-A-I-N-E. And we'll certainly go back in and jump in and watch the uh, comments and answer questions in the replay. I will post it on LinkedIn and on Facebook. So Kate, um, hang in there after we end the broadcast just so I can say goodbye. Yeah, and sure. um, thank you all again for tuning in. Thanks everyone. Bye.